Hello, I'm Elizabeth, and I am Catholic Lady Talks, and we're doing Great Lion of God by Taylor Caldwell. We're at chapter 47. The story of the miraculous deliverance exalted the Christian community, and they never tired of hearing about it and the heavenly messenger. If Saul had been so rescued and by such an ineffable personage, then surely the Messiah's second coming was at hand. It does not follow, said Saul. What if the laborers in the field said, we believe the master will return home tonight and will ask us to feast with him? So why should we labor and exhaust ourselves and not stand at the gates and watch for his coming? The, ma the master would return to discover that the grain had rotted because it had, been re had not been reaped, and woe to that man who had let his Sith remain idle. We do not know when he will return but he must not find his harvest lost and the rats among the grain and the bread devoured by vermin. It seemed to many that Saul was too harsh and that he did not believe that the Lord would imminently arrive, so there was much discontent. But Saul exhorted them and told, taught them like children, and after a long sojourn in Philippi, he resumed his journeys. He rejoiced in the gathering multitudes of Gentile converts who, whom he patiently taught with a paternal love. He baptized them, guided them, enlightened them, and brought them in, rejoicing in the Christian community. The majority of Christians welcomed him with almost the deep love which Saul held for them. But there were also dark glances of suspicion and contention and whispers among the majority. These were sometimes quite valid, for some of the new Christians were at first exalted by the thought of the most instantaneous arrival of the Messiah in clouds of glory, to judge the quick and the dead, the sheep and the goats, and when he did not appear, but the daily drudgery and weariness remained, and the same problems of taxes and food and shelter and discontented wives and intransient children and wages and quarrels and ills of the flesh, the new Christians began to doubt, and frequently doubt was followed by defection and contempt and hatred and ridicule and even malice and desire for vengeance on the deceivers. In vain did, Paul, did Saul try to enlighten these men and women. They would look at him narrowly and narrowly smiling. He had promised them ecstasy of soul and a seat in heaven, but the world remained the same, and the Messiah tarried. If he ever intended to return at all, or if there was any truth in Saul's words, they had sought, he saw, not the rapture of the oneness with God, not the deliverance from sin and death, not the delight of service and virtue, but worldly affluence and comfort and triumph. Did you not tell us of the words of Christ that if we accepted the, king of he the kingdom of heaven, all else will be given us? Yet nothing has been given. The world remains the same in our misery and our hopelessness in spite of our acceptance. His kingdom is not of this world, Saul would repeat, but they contradicted him with his own quotations from the words of the Messiah and they resented his explanations and interpretations. So they defected. Some of the Christian Jews said to him with gloomy satisfaction, What other did you expect, Saul ben Hillel? They cannot comprehend the Messiah, nor can they encompass his parables which echo the old scriptures. The more educated of the Gentile converts, in particular the Greeks, said they are ignorant and venal, low slaves or freedmen or peasants. Their old religions taught them only earthly joys and victories, if they please the gods, and they cannot understand spiritual rewards. But Saul grieved over these wandering sheep, and wept over them and prayed for them, and some returned in the world they found no hope at all, no love or companionship, no friends, no concern for their welfare. At least in the Christian community, they had friendship, and they were hungry, and they were fed, and if they were thirsty, they were given wine, and if they had no shelter, a roof was found for them. 
Let us not drive them forth like intruding cattle, these poor little ones, said Saul to the vexed Christians. Did he not seek the lost sheep and bring them home? There is room in his house for the very meanest and the most humble and stupid, and his wings can cover all humanity. Let us be patient and teach and bring light to those small minds. And who knows, but one day they will shine suddenly like the sun. As Saul traveled in Asia Minor and in Europe, he not only founded new churches, but increased and heartened and established, and heartened the established. He wrote always endless letters full of eloquence and poetry and passion. And Aquila and his wife Priscilla, who had once sheltered him, his letters were cherished and treasured and guarded, but many were lost forever, though their spirit remained. He suffered stonings, blows, floggings, and shipwrecks on his journeys. For to the pious Jews, he was still the great renegade, and many of the Christians remembered his earlier persecutions of the church, and priests of local religions presented him resented his converts and their loss of revenue, and the Romans were suspicious of this white-maned man who spoke in cultured accents but lived like a slave. Such men were dangerous, as the history had noted, for they did not love the things of the world and incited men against the world. And the world was the theater for law and order and Roman prosperity. And what else existed but the world of men, and perhaps the gods? Besides, it was reputed that he spoke of the conquest of the world, and that was treasonous. Yet multitudes of Romans also became converts, and soldiers and their officers, including those in Philippi who had spread the wondrous tale of Saul's deliverance from prison. As a number of these were the rich, as a number of these were rich, the church could expand her charitable endeavors and succor the sick and the dying and the abandoned and the children left to die of exposure and runaway slaves and the aged and the former prisoners. Great ladies in various cities became Christians and found in their new faith a rescue from boredom and fear, an inspiration beyond mere physical beauty and fleshly pleasures. Becoming Christians, they were charitable, and their hearts, for the first time in their pampered lives, were moved by the misery of their fellow men, whom they had once regarded as lower than vermin. One day Saul said to Timothy, who was now himself no longer young, My time grows shorter. I have had a vision. I must return again to Jerusalem. And when I saw the vision, I saw a darkening over the beloved city. And never again after that will I see her. You are weary, said Timothy. Your tired flesh speaks, and not your soul. But Saul had his premonitions. I long to see my sister again, and her grandchildren, whom I have never seen, he said evasively. I hear of my nephew Amos and his triumphs during his travels and ministrations, and I might encounter him in Jerusalem. He smiled at Timothy. I am only a man, and I need human comforting, though none appears aware of that. He received letters from Lucanus and answered them, and they rejoiced in each other's victories and converts. One day, wrote Lucanus, there will not be a people or a nation that will be ignorant of his name, and the triumph he foretold will have come to pass. Press on, dear friend. Though you complain of bodily weakness and a weariness that will not lift, it is only our flesh, and it can be commanded and subdued, for he will give us sustenance for our souls and not let us die before we have accomplished our mission. Saul sighed on receiving this letter. He had come on a period of dryness where the way was no longer plain and all inspiration had been removed. He knew the truth. But his mind felt dulled, and his volition was faltering. Sometimes he dreamt of his house in Tarsus, now sold to strangers, and he could smell the roses and the jasmine again 
and see the black carved bridge. Over the peaceful water and the arbors and the grottoes, his whole being craved for surcease, for quiet loving voices and the touch of loving hands and the sun setting on palm and cypress and pomegranate trees and sycamore and gentle music in the atrium and the smiles and voice of his dead son whose children he had never seen. Sometimes he dreamt that he was a child again, laughing at Aristo and teasing his little sister Sephora. And sometimes he dreamt of Dassel and her love for him. His love for her no longer seemed lewd and wicked, but the love of a young Adam for his Eve, and the place of the waterfall was the Garden of Eden. And there were times when he was beset by evil agonies, which he recognized but could not only but could only strive against weakly, though knowing their source. Had it all been a phantom, a dream, his whole life? Sometimes he groaned like Job. My eye is also dim by reason of sorrow, and all my members are as a shadow. In this dark confusion, he would wander for days and even weeks, and all that he said and did during that time was as if he struggled in manacles of iron. He found his followers tedious and dull, and he found even his devoted Timothy to be obtuse. His native impatience, fed by illness and age, would be like a flame in his heart, and his flesh would itch, and he would scratch himself until he bled. All sought his comfort and his enlightenment. All believed he was more than man. If they saw his exhaustion, they were dismayed and troubled, but felt little pity. For was he not the shepherd, and they only the sheep? And must the sheep not be eternally comforted and sustained, or the shepherd be held guilty? When he saw their faces, Saul would arouse himself by sheer power of will, for if the sheep doubted or felt lost, they might well stray. They were fragile and uncertain in the wilderness of their lives and could stumble. So he would speak to them resolutely, with a smile on his ashen lips, and they were relieved. Then one night he received the summons to return to Jerusalem, and he awoke, saying to himself, the beginning of the end has arrived, and soon I will find rest. That's the end of chapter 48. We'll continue with 49 shortly.